morning. Good morning and welcome to Coffee and Prayer. I'm Pastor Andrew of Carter and it is 5.30 a.m. here Sunday morning on 4th of July uh, in Inglewood, California. You guys, please let me know where you are as you're tuning in and what time it is where you guys are at. What is up? Good morning and welcome in. You guys, happy Independence Day if you're from the United States. Okay, I understand we got brothers and sisters from around the world. Some of y'all are like, we don't even celebrate 4th of July and that's okay. Uh, we welcome you in. If you guys are watching this on the replay or maybe you're on the podcast, I just want you guys to know that I love you, I honor you, and I am thankful that you guys are here uh, regardless of what time you're here. There's never any pressure. I don't have any pressure. There's no pressure on my end for you guys to be here live, especially on the weekend, right? I get it. For me, I'm up at 4.30 every day anyway, right? Except for one mishap we had a few weeks ago. I had one morning where uh, my brother Carlos, he, um, he twisted my arm, right? I'm, I'm going to take zero, I'm going to take zero responsibility for this. Carlos, uh, he, it was national donut day. All right. And he sent, uh, this, just this uh, disgusting picture of these amazing donuts. And he's like, Hey man, it's national donut day. And I was like, that's the dumbest thing ever a national donut day. But as the day went on, right, he planted this seed in my mind. And I'm just like, man, donuts do sound good. I haven't had a donut in a long time. Like, boy, what I would do for a donut. And so Kyra and I grub hubbed uh, Randy's Donuts, which is an amazing donut spot here in Inglewood, California. And I got myself two apple fritters, which were the size of the paper plate that I put them on. And uh, I, I ate two of them two of them, donuts the size of my head, and I went into an immediate carbohydrate and sugar coma. Um, I went to bed not only early, but I slept hard, so hard that I slept through my alarm, woke up at 5.34 and ran down here, didn't even put coffee in my cup and did coffee and prayer, sans coffee, sans pants. Guys, I didn't even put pants on, right? I know that's a little, I had underwear, like calm down. I wasn't here inappropriate, but I had boxer shorts on, but it was like, I didn't want to be late. I scrambled down here and um, didn't even wash the stuff out of my eyes. And we had an amazing coffee and prayer. It was a beautiful thing, but it was all Carlos's fault. I'll take zero accountability. He planted a seed of deception early in the day it took root and birthed itself as a gluttonous sin, which led into sloth and laziness the next day. But they were good and it was absolutely worth it. Glory to God. We made it. We had coffee and prayer. It was still a beautiful thing. You guys had grace with me. But um, that's how I'm feeling this Sunday morning. I'm feeling good. Uh, you know, funny thing. I got a couple things. I promise we'll get to scripture. We're reading Revelation chapter 12, which this is this symbolic introduction of some of these key figures. Uh, as I read it, I'm just like, whoa, who's the woman, the dragon, the snake? There's a child. There's Michael. Like there's all of these key characters that are being introduced. Uh, it, it takes span over past, present and future. It's a lot. I would encourage you guys to do your own research. But two things. Um, first off, literally one minute before I push start, I tweaked my back, right? Uh, my back just tweaked. Like it, it's the weirdest thing as you get older. Um, and I'm not old by any means. I'm in great shape. I exercise, I eat well, uh, I move quite a bit, but I think that the angle that I'm sitting here and looking at the screen, something happened where I, I pushed, I was about to push the play button and my back just started tensing up and I'm going, Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Oh, and then it went and I was like, Oh dude, I just tweaked my back. It took my breath away. I'm at the age where I'm nervous to sneeze, right? I'm, I'm nervous to sneeze too hard. I'm just like, I could put a rib out. I could put my back out. Long gone are the days of I could do twister. I could jump out of trees. I could play basketball for six hours. Now I'm at this stage where I'm like, I can do like just the most random things can put me in a weird position and get things out of alignment just the weirdest thing. Like who would have thought, like, I wish I could have come here and like, yeah, you guys, there was an old lady in a burning house and I climbed this tree and put her over my shoulder. And you know, we, I, we scaled out of the building. I saved her life, but I tweaked my back. No, I was like rolling the window up and tweaked my back. Like, come on, man. 
not even a cool story. Like, it, no. So now your boy's like, ugh, we're going to get through this and um, go figure out. We're going to go hit the foam roller, maybe some stretch. And I stretch every day. Anyways, let's uh, let's move forward. You guys are like, dude, we're five minutes in and you haven't even talked about Jesus yet. Well, it's going to be another couple minutes because here's what um, we're going to get into Exodus. And Exodus talks about uh, Pharaoh and the taskmaster uh, and um, Aaron and Moses going to him and, you know, petitioning him to let their people go. And his response is to, you know, make the workload and their burden even greater. And when the Israelites, the Hebrews, they receive this harder work, we'll get into it they come to this place where they almost lose faith. They almost give up. They're just like, what? This is like, look what you've done to us. You know, you've, you've, you hyped us up. You got us all bold. We think we're going to go in here and tell Pharaoh what it is. And he's just going to let us go. No, I mean, he made things harder for us. It reminded me of this, right? Um, right now, the NBA, the NBA free agency is taking place. And if you don't understand the NBA, that's fine. I don't really watch a lot of sports anymore these days. But uh, right now, the free agent, there's a lot of wild trades going on in, in basketball, professional basketball. There's individuals that are being traded from different teams. There's people being signed. There's all kinds of moves that are being done. It's like a chess game in the summer. People are moving pieces strategically, trying to increase the success of their team. Many championships are won during the off season. In the off season, you're, you're trading people from different teams. You're signing people. You're extending contracts. You're trying to create and build a team that will be cohesive, that will put together a great run. So at the end of the year, this time next year, you are not only a champion, but you're, you know, you're basically back at it again. But, but, uh, the goal right now is to, to move things around in order to build a championship team. Um, my team uh, is the Portland Trailblazers. I love the Portland Trailblazers. I have been a fan of their team um, since I can ever remember. I was born in Portland, and so I grew up in California, and some of my only ties were holding tight to a team uh, of a state and a city that I had never been to. So being born in Portland, I've naturally been a Portland Trailblazer fan. And if you know anything about sports, Portland hasn't won an NBA championship since, I believe, 1977. Um, it is, they've, they've never won a championship in my lifetime. The closest they've got was like in the early nineties when they played against Michael Jordan and that Bulls dynasty team where Clyde Drexler was there, uh, Clyde the Glide, and they lost the championship. Some of you guys are like, I have no idea what you're talking about, but hang in there. There's been many times as a Portland Trailblazers fan that I've been disappointed that I've wanted to turn my back on my team. I see the success of you know, maybe the, the Lakers in the early 2000s, it's like, God, I'd love to be a Lakers fan. You know, they got Kobe Bryant, they got Shaq, they even knocked us out of the Western Conference Finals when we had an opportunity to win another championship. We've put together some good teams. We've had players like Brandon Roy and Greg Oden. Uh, we've, we've put together these great runs, Zach Randolph, Damon Stoudemire. It, it's been, it's been good, but it's been really challenging. And, and what you would call somebody, who leaves their team for another team, you'd call them a bandwagon uh, fan, is they would jump from team to team. My kids are bandwagon fans. When it's Golden State, they love Golden State. There was a time when they loved the Cavaliers when LeBron was on there. They, like, they, they, loved the, they, they loved the teams that are doing well. You're jumping on the bandwagon of the newest, greatest team that's doing well. What I would be called, or, or what other people would be called, is they're fans only when they're doing good. They would call that a fair weather fan, right? A fair weather fan. When things are good, oh yeah, man, I've been a fan since I was, you know, a little kid. And you start bringing up the memories, you're a fair weather fan. What I'm here to say is that sometimes we are uh, fair weather Christians. Let that sink in for just a moment. When things are good, when God's blessing you, when your life is on the up and up and things are heading in your direction, you know, you're just like, oh, God is good. I'm so thankful. I'm so grateful. I'm so honored. Oh, man, I'm going to sing of your praises. But when things aren't going your well, going, going your way or aren't going so well, many people turn their back on God. Right. Many people 
turn their back on God and they become fair weather Christians, right? And what we're going to see is a picture of the Hebrews in Exodus that they're that that they're on the verge of becoming fair weather followers of God. Uh, they almost turn their back on God. So just because circumstances, just because your environment, just because things aren't going good, those are the times that we need to draw closer to Him. So I'm reminded as the free agency is going on and we might not be making moves and trades and the deals that are going to set us up for a championship, a true fan stays loyal to their team through the ups and the downs, the highs and the lows. And in the same way as Christians, we are to hold tight to God through the ups and the downs, through the suffering and the pain, through the grief, through uh, you know the tribulations, the trials, all of the things that are frustrating. If anything, those are the times that we need to be closer to God as he is the one who is carrying us through those seasons. Amen? Mm, mm, mm. Mm, that was good stuff. That was a good analogy, man. You see how I set you guys up? We're talking about sports. Some of you guys are like, oh, no, not the sports. But here we go. And it ties it all in together, man. Let's not be fair weather Christians. Let's not just follow God and, and trust in God um, when things are good. Right? When things are good. Uh, that's a good question. Somebody said... How do prosperity preachers maintain their memberships even when their members get the lows in life too? No, I have no idea. I have no idea. I don't, I don't believe in prosperity gospel. That's a great question. And you would think that people would see through that, right? I think that a lot of people, when they're in those situations, they start questioning themselves. They start thinking that God's mad at them or maybe they've done something wrong or said something wrong and they're being punished in that aspect. But suffering is a part of life. Grief is a part of life. Tragedy is a part of life. Change is a part of life. Seasons are a part of life. There's going to be ups and downs, highs and lows. The only promise of prosperity that I'm holding on to is the promise of being prosperous when I enter into heaven. Um, I look at the examples of the martyrs. I look at the examples of the apostles. I look at the examples of those who walked with Jesus, who actually had physical interaction. Their life wasn't filled with prosperity. Like they were prosperous in the spirit. They were rich in the spirit. But many of them faced and experienced a death that was painful, that was, um, that, that was, uh, you know, they were punished. They were torn limb from limb. They were hung upside down. They were boiled alive. They were beaten. They were uh, exiled from places. They were shipwrecked. They were bitten by snakes, like the lives that they lived. I'm not saying that that's what it is to be a follower of Jesus, that if your life isn't um, defined or, or marked by martyrdom, uh, by being a martyr, then you're not a follower of Jesus. I'm not saying that by any means, because I understand that we all have giftings. We all have places. We all have roles that we play within the body. And even in the body, finances are a very real thing. We need kingdom millionaires. We need kingdom financiers. We need individuals who have, um, materials and they have resources just like in the new Testament. There were some churches that were set up better than others, and they were able to feed and finance the work of the apostles and those doing the work. Um, and so if, if, you're, if your life isn't filled with martyrdom, it doesn't mean that you're not a good follower of Jesus, but uh, you just understand that not everybody uh, was called to that level of prosperity here on this earth. Jesus even says, yo, if you're, if you're, if you're rich here on this earth, like that's going to be challenging. You're going to have different challenges, right? It's going to be challenging not to make money your God. It's going to be challenging not to make your lack of need because when you have a lot of money, you need God less, right? Because your money solves a lot of your problems. When you're super duper rich, many of those people turn from God because they don't really need him, right? If there's an issue, they can usually buy their way out of it. So there's no need for God. Those who are poor, we have to run to God a lot more often, right? We're just kind of like, oh man, there's this reliance that we have when our resources are low, we become more reliant. So there's this prayer and it's like, God, make me, you know, I, I want to have enough money so that I don't have to steal, but I don't want so much money that I forget about you. You know what I mean? I don't want so much that I don't need you, but I don't want so little that I got to commit crimes just to get by. Like I want that happy medium where I'm fully reliant upon you, but I don't have to resort to like some shady handlings in order to get by or to put food on the table. Anyway. Let's pray. Let's jump into Revelation. Um, great conversation. Uh, I already see the Holy Spirit's going to lead this.
today. Uh, so Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you for today. We want to thank you for your love, your mercy, your grace, your provision. We thank you for your truth. We're so honored and, and truly grateful um, that you would bring us to this place. It's, uh, it's, it's a Monday morning. I think earlier I said it's a Sunday. I don't know what day it is, Lord, but we know that you are the Lord of the day. You are the king of the day. You are the savior of our day. You are with us always. You love us. You're merciful. You're kind. You're gentle. You're compassionate. You're understanding. Uh, and God, we just want to honor you. We want to give you praise. We want to give you glory. Um, let this place and this space be safe. That individuals feel comfortable coming here and um, learning about you knowing you more intimately, that we would leave this place changed and transformed, that we would be confronted, that you would speak to our innermost being, that you would help us to have a deeper, better understanding of you and of your word, and uh, just that we would be receptive, that the things that are pulling out our attention and pulling out our focus, that you would tear those things down in the name of Jesus. There are so many things that are drawing at our uh, attention, trying to Pull us away from what it is that you're trying to reveal to us, Lord. So please uh, give us your divine revelation. Help us to leave this place uh, uh, just, just clearer of the plan, purpose, and will that you have for our lives. God, we love you and thank you. And we pray this in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. God is so good. So, so good. Mm. I'm asking for divine healing in my back. That would be good. I, I believe that God can heal that by the end of this coffee and prayer. Thank you, Jesus. So what we find here in Revelation chapter 12, just a reminder, you guys are reading this on your own. I'm not reading it all to you. I'm going to give you guys a little bit of context, food for thought, and uh, just some, some conversation, right? So we understand that the seventh trumpet has been sounded uh, back in chapter 11. And what we see is kind of like another vision. It, it says at the end of 11, then there were flashes of lightning, noises, thunder, an earthquake, and a great hailstorm. And then a great wonder appeared in heaven. Uh, and so, again, this is a symbolic introduction that takes place like we jump all over the place. Past, present, and future, right? Past, present, and and future symbolic introductions where each of these figures actually represent somebody and we'll get down to that. It says, a great wonder appeared in heaven. A woman was clothed with the sun and the moon was under her feet and a crown of 12 stars was on her head. From the research that I did, right, using a search engine of my choice and using Bible ref and blue letter and different resources um, to read up on this, the woman represents the, the nation of Israel right? It's Israel. So when we're addressing the woman, the woman is Israel. It said that she was pregnant and cried out with pain because she was about to give birth. Then another wonder appeared in heaven and it was a giant red dragon with seven heads and seven crowns on each head. This is Satan, right? The red dragon, giant red dragon. Uh, he stood in front of the woman who was ready to give birth so he could eat her baby as soon as it was born. Uh, we look at um, when Jesus was born, there was a decree to kill all of the the male babies, right? The, the devil was looking to devour the Savior. He was trying his best. He was making an attempt at the child. Um, and so the woman that the baby that, that the woman gives birth to in verse five, it says, then the woman gave birth to a son who will rule all the nations with an iron rod um, is Jesus. And her child was taken up to God to his throne. The, room, the woman ran away into the desert uh, to a place God prepared for her. So now we're talking about these events that um, have occurred, that are occurring, and that will occur, right? It says uh, in verse 7, there was, <clears throat> there was a war in heaven. What's going on here? Everybody calm down. Everybody calm down. It says, uh, there was a war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and the dragon and his angels fought back. But the dragon was not strong enough and he and his angels lost their place in heaven. Um, according to Job, so if you look back in the book of Job, this is something I read that was interesting that caught my attention and I would encourage you guys to do your own research. Um, the, in Job, 
devil had access to God. He could go back and forth to and fro and he was accusing and, you know, he was going back and forth. What this alludes to is that there was this, it wasn't the initial fall, but there was this final fall. The devil makes one last attempt at the, the throne of God and there's a war and he's cast down and like, that's it, right? That is a wrap. But there was, I believe that there was a time that he was kicked out of heaven, but he still was able, like in the book of Job, to go up and, and to interact with God in this manner where he was able to approach the throne, right? And that's just, that's what I, I read. And um, it's just interesting that now there's this, this point where he says, nope, that's enough. You're done. There's a war. The dragon goes up there trying to make an attempt at the throne and Michael overthrows him. Um, what we see and what we're about to, to see is one of my favorite, um, we, one of my favorite verses comes from Revelation chapter 12, verse 11. And it says, and, um, our, our, you know, we, we defeat him by the blood of the lamb and the power of our testimony. And, uh, that's one of my favorite verses. I'm going to jump back to that in just a second. It says, uh, you know, the devil has come down to you. He was thrown out of heaven. He was thrown to the earth and he's filled with anger because he knows he does not have much time. His time is short. He knows that once he's thrown out of heaven where there's that, that, that last war, that war between Michael, uh, the angels, him and his fallen angels, once he's cast down to the earth, he's filled with anger and he is, um, he, he understands that his time is short. He understands where he's at on the timeline. And so, uh, the verse 11 is powerful and it speaks to me because I believe that one of the most powerful tools that we have is our testimony, right? One of the most powerful tools that we have when it comes to evangelizing and sharing the gospel and helping people know Jesus better is our testimony by the blood of the lamb, the power of the blood of Jesus, right? The power of the blood of Jesus and, uh, the, the, the power of our testimony, we are able to be effective tools of, of the gospel. One thing that people can't do is they cannot refute your testimony. You can sit here and talk about um, evolution. You can sit here and talk about all of the bad things that religion has done. There's so many things. There's so many ways that people can refute your belief. They can mock you. They can, you know, they can do all of these things. But one thing that they cannot do one thing that they cannot do is refute your own personal testimony, right? They can't refute your testimony. What I experienced and what God carried me through and what he did for me, the things that he did in my life, in my personal relationship, you cannot argue with that. We overcome him. They, they defeat him. They, they, um, they, they overpower the enemy by the blood of Jesus Christ, right? The power of the blood. We talked about that the other day and the power of your testimony. You guys utilize your testimony when it comes to evangelizing, sharing the gospel and letting people know the transformational power of Jesus Christ. There's something powerful that says, hey, I once was lost, but now I'm found. This is where I was at. And because of Jesus, I've tried everything else. Nothing else worked, but because of the blood of Jesus, because of of, of uh, the sacrifice that he made, his death, burial, and resurrection, because he is the way, the truth, and the life, because of the power of Christ, I am now saved. I'm now found. This is where I'm at now. I'm not perfect. There's, I'm still a work in progress. There's still a lot of things that need to be done, but this is where I was. This is where I'm at. And this is where you can be too if you receive the free gift of salvation. It's so, so good. I, I, I love that. One thing I want to share. Never mind, never mind. We're gonna go, we're gonna finish this chapter. Uh, the symbolic introduction. There's only a few more verses. Um, when the dragon saw that he had been thrown down to earth, he hunted for the woman. Remember, the wo woman is Israel, who had given birth to the son. But the woman was given this supernatural protection. The woman was given the two wings of a great eagle, so she could fly to the place prepared for her in the desert. She would be taken care of there for three and a half years, away from the snake. Um, the snake poured water out of its mouth. Again, from what I looked into, water coming from its mouth is, um, it's this armed invasion. The, the, the nation of Israel is on the run. They're hiding from the serpent. There's this 
um, be, because the, the, the red dragon is so angry, he's there trying to take out all of his anger and his wrath out on Israel, out on the nation of Israel, on the woman. And so there's this supernatural protection and hiding where the nation of Israel is covered supernaturally. And so here we see there's these armed invasions. There's um, the, the snake pouring water out of its mouth. But even then, the earth helped the woman by opening its mouth. There's this massive earthquake and swallows the river that comes from the mouth of the dragon. And then the dragon was very angry at the woman and went off to make war against all her other children. All her other children are those who obey God's command, who have the message that Jesus taught. So we're seeing this symbolic introduction of these different key figures that are going to play out um, even more in the next coming chapters. Um, again, there's a lot of symbolism. Again, there's a lot of things that um, I don't know, right? I, and I'm okay with saying that. I don't know how people have come to this conclusion. It's through research. It's through dedication. It's through re revelation, spirit-filled revelation, divine revelation. It's through individuals cross-referencing events that take place in the Old Testament with the New Testament. Um, it's, it's a beautiful thing, but I'm okay to say like, when it comes to revelation, I love it. It's edifying. It's encouraging. Again, for me, it gives me this sense of urgency of like, okay, there are individuals out there who are lost. This gives me this idea of, hey, we need to be on point. The way that we live our lives is of the utmost importance. But when we're done here with Revelation, my emphasis and the ministry that God has, has given me, allowed me to be a steward over. The ministry that we um, are passionate about is, is the ministry of getting people saved, right? Is the, 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 the ministry of getting people equipped and armed to fight the good fight, equipping individuals for the harvest. It says that the harvest is great, but the workers are few. This definitely helps give the workers a sense of urgency. Um, but at the end of the day, many people will ask, hey, I want to, you know, I just got saved. Where should I start in the Bible? I personally, this is my opinion. This isn't scriptural. It doesn't say where you should start. I believe that we should start in, in, in Matthew. Mark, Luke, and John. I believe that we should read the Gospels. I believe that we need to know the life and times of Jesus Christ. I believe that we need to model the way that we live after the way that Jesus lived. I want, for, for a new believer, if I have 24 hours to live, I want them to understand the Gospel, the free gift of salvation, the good news that, hey, you are a sinner, you're separated from God, but there was somebody who came, God in the flesh, who made it possible for you to have relation with God. And it's not by any amount of works. It's not something that we even deserve. It's a free gift of salvation because God is loving, because he's merciful, and because he carried the burden. He paid the price. He paid the penalty for our sins. So for me, my emphasis and my excitement is found in the gospel. I was scared to get into Revelation. I was nervous to get into Revelation. It's overwhelming. It's confusing. It can be frustrating. It doesn't make sense. There's so many people who are greater and smarter and more educated who have gone before me and have done a great job of deciphering it, but even even then, I'm just like, why is this important, right? And this is just me ranting. Why is it so important? I understand now that we're reading it and that we're attacking it. It's important because it gives you this sense of urgency. It gives you a timeline. It's spoken to me. We're only in 12 chapters of it. It spoke to me. It's, it's funny how there was this hesitance, right? It's, I'll share this. I've read this book, this, this actual specific one, multiple times. I've read this multiple times. It's a devotional, but it's the New Testament. Um, I've read it multiple times. And I'll tell you, this is, this is the first time that I've actually gone through Revelation in this, in this devotional. I would get all the way to Jude and I'd be like, ah, Revelation, I'm good because it intimidated me. It intimidated me. And so I would jump back to Matthew and I'd read all the way back up to Jude. And I've read Revelation. Don't get me wrong. I've read Revelation a couple of times, but it was so confusing. I was just like, man, I've been fed. I've been edified, encouraged. There's been these revelations, but nothing, it's nothing's really stood out to me in Revelation, right? Nothing. But this time going into it with a sense of like, I'm here, I'm going to get into it. I'm going to read about it. I'm going to do extra research. It has been so eye opening. It's been so enlightening. It's been so refreshing because now we can start to grasp what's going on, understanding that it's symbolic, understanding that some of the things uh, uh, happened in the past, some of the things are were presently happening, some of the things were off in the future. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing. It's a picture of what we are saved from and what we don't have to experience 
experience. It's confirmation, right? It's revelation. It's, it's that. It's opening your eyes. And like I said, for me, all it's doing is it's creating this big stamp of urgency. Hey, ASAP, your life is not about you. You better start moving quickly because there are people that you love that if you don't speak to, if you don't get the ball rolling, they might have to be around for this, right? They might have to be around for this. So it's a stamp of urgency for me and confirmation, man. But I'm not scared to say, I'm not scared to get on here and be like, look, man, I, I'm still learning it. It's still being revealed to me. I'm having to do a lot of research, a lot more research than I did through a lot of the other books. I'm having to really get in here and I'm like, what is the dragon? Who is this lady, right? I, I mean, I get the dragon. Dragon's kind of a no-brainer, but I'm like, who's the woman, right? What is this? What do you mean you just gave her wings and she float, she flies off and now there's water coming out of a snake's mouth and it's trying to eat. It's trying to, to flood them out. But now the earth opened up and the flood goes away. What is going on, John? What were you taking back then? You're seeing these visions, man. Whoa. Time out, bro. We need to have a chat. What does all of this even mean? But it's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing. I love it. Glory to God. So the one thing I wanted to say before we jump into Exodus is this. Um, it's, it called him, it called the devil in verse 10, the accuser of the brethren. Do you guys understand that? The accuser of the brethren. He's the great deceiver and he's also the father of lies. One of the things that he's doing right now is he is deceiving not just believers, but he's deceiving the nations. He's deceiving non-believers. He's deceiving unbelievers. He's deceiving people of this world right now. And he's making them think that the people of God, followers of Christ, that were dangerous, that were deluded, and that were destructive. You guys understand that? That we're, 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 we're dangerous, that we're deluded and we're destructive. Right now, with what's taking place in the government, with the Roe versus Wade, with um, with uh, coming against you know Pride Month, the stances that Christians take, followers of Christ take, are in opposition of the stance that the world takes. Can we just let's just agree on that? What Christians stand for, which is the truth of God, stands in the opposition of many people's freedoms, right? They want the freedom to do whatever they want. It's my life. It's my choice. I want to be able to do this, this, and this, X, Y, and Z, and I don't want anybody to stop me. I don't want anybody to stop me. I want to be able to do whatever it is that I want to do without any opposition. And what Christians are doing is we stand in the gap and we say, hey, okay, there is a uh, free will and you're able to do all of those free things, but we want you to know that there are consequences for a life lived that way. And so what we're trying to do is we out of love because we love you and based on what we believe, we're trying to save you from eternal hellfire. What that looks like to the world because of the accuser of the brethren is that looks like we're trying to control that we don't want them to live their best life. It looks like we hate anything that is in, that, that opposes our beliefs. It looks like we are trying to uh, keep people from doing the things that they want to do. When in truth and reality, we're merely sharing these things because we love them. It's not because, hey, we don't, it's not, we're not trying to keep you from having fun. We're trying to keep you from spending eternity in hell. That's what it's from. This is coming from a place of love. We love you, so we're trying to prevent this consequence. But what it comes off to them is that we're deluded, that we're controlling, that we're destructive, and that we're dangerous. This is one of the great deceptions. And, and they've put up these walls around their ears. They don't want to hear it. They don't want to see it. The, the, their, their, their argument is completely delusional and it's irrational that because what we believe, right, they want us to respect everything that they believe and live a certain life and do everything that they want according to the world, according to their flesh. But heaven forbid we stand in the gap and practice the things that we believe and stand true, Right. They want all of the freedoms. They want to do everything they can, but they, they, they try to silence us. They try to mute us. They try to keep us from helping. 
All we're trying to do is love them, man. All we're trying to do is save them. All we're trying to do is keep them. And what, what, what we're doing is, is, is out of love. But I just want to remind you that the great deceiver, the accuser of the brethren, like his, what he has done is he has uh, put a strong delusion over this world. And so what they, they look at us as if we are crazy, as if we are hateful, uh, that we're dangerous. They're trying to take Bible. They're trying to ban Bibles. They're, they're saying that Christianity is now hate speech. That's delusional. That's crazy. Now, please don't get me wrong. Has religion been used to control? Absolutely. Has religion been abused? 100%. Has religion in the wrong hands, in the, in the hands of wicked and evil and selfish people, has it been used to, uh, as, a, as a tool of oppression? Absolutely. Absolutely. It, it most definitely has been. So I understand some of the things that they, um, that they, they look at. It has been. Um, but at the end of the day, that's religion in the hands of man. That's not Jesus. Right. That's not Jesus. It, well, what they're doing is they're 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 rejecting Jesus because of the failures and the flaws and the mishandlings of man. It's not Jesus. It's not Jesus. So that right there, with that said, my point is this is um, we are ambassadors of Christ. We are representatives Everywhere we go, we take the Holy Spirit with us and uh, are, are just that. We are um, ambassadors of Christ. We're spokespersons. We're spokespeople for him. How you live your life is of the utmost importance. How you deal and interact with people is of the utmost importance. There's no room for us to be living double lives or to be living one way, saying one thing and then doing the other. We are representatives of Jesus, so be very careful uh, uh, how you live your life, and not just out in public, but behind closed doors, because the things that are done in dark will always come to light. So be um, diligent, be, uh, or have integrity. You guys have integrity. Amen. Let's talk about um, Exodus real quick. And uh, I know it's, for some reason, I thought it was Sunday. My days, these holiday weekend things are, um, they are something else, right? I know it's not just a holiday weekend thing. I understand that it's Independence Day. I got my God bless America hat with the, the red, white, and blue. Um, I'm, I'm grateful to be in the nation that I'm in. Um, and it's, uh, it, there, there's a sense of gratitude there because I understand that, um, not every place has the freedoms that we do. I understand that there are brothers and sisters in Christ around this world who are experiencing real persecution. Um, Bibles are banned in some places. People are being uh, rooted out uh, of, of basement churches. People are being executed. People are being truly martyred and truly persecuted for their faith. There's places that don't have the same religious freedoms that we do. And I understand ours are slowly but surely being taken away, but um, I, I am grateful and thankful for the place that I'm in. Yeah, I had no idea that today was Monday. I, I completely, completely forgot. But um, in Exodus, I want to share this. Exodus chapter 5 is the first encounter with Pharaoh. So understand in, in chapter four, Moses was being called. He was like filled with anxiousness. He was making excuses. He didn't want to answer the call. He was questioning God. God was just like, look, man, it's you. I've called you. As a matter of fact, we're gonna, uh, I'm gonna send you Aaron. Aaron's gonna help you talk. He's gonna be the mouthpiece. He's gonna be your mouthpiece. You, you, um, you're gonna you know, have your ear to me and you're gonna share with him and he's gonna be your spokesperson, right? Um, and so he goes and he talks to the elders of the children of Israel and they give him their speech. He shows them the miracles that he sent from God. They buy into it. The people believe they're with him. They're just like, let's go. I love it. So afterwards, Moses and Aaron, they go in to tell Pharaoh, they go in and they say, Hey, thus says the Lord, let my people go that they may hold a feast to me in the wilderness. And Pharaoh's like, who is the Lord, right? That I should, who, who is he that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I don't know the Lord. Nor will I let Israel go. Like, who are you guys? You guys are tripping. I'm not going to, excuse me. I'm not going to just let them go. And then he says, um, th so then they, they resort to like, well, the God of the Hebrews has met with us. Please let us go three days journey into the desert and sacrifice to the Lord, our God. 
um, lest he fall upon us with pestilence or with the sword. The king of Egypt, he said, Moses and Aaron, why do you take people from their work? He said, get back to your labor. You Listen, man, you guys are over here. You're taking a break. We don't got time for breaks. You're over here talking about letting you go a three-day journey, making sacrifices to the Lord. I don't know the Lord. As a matter of fact, you're wasting my time. He said, look, the people of the land are many now, and you make them rest from their labor. Like the audacity. You're over here wasting my time. People are taking a break. I'm losing money. I got stuff to do. I got pyramids to build. I've got thing. I've got, you know, the, the sphinx of whatever, you know, the, the, the face, you know what I'm talking about. We've got, we've got monuments to build and you're over here talking about a break, taking three days off. You want a holiday weekend? Look, you don't get a holiday weekend. You don't get to celebrate independence day. You got to work. So the same day Pharaoh commanded the taskmasters of the people, their officers saying, look, you know what? The audacity that they had to come over here and ask me for a break, a three-day weekend. You, know, you shall no longer give the people to uh, people straw to make the bricks. But they got to get their own straw. But they're still going to have to come up with the same quota. So we're going to take away one of the vital materials that they need to make the bricks that they're, that they're doing. But we're not even going to adjust the quota. We want the same amount of bricks, but now they got to go get their own straw, right? Let them go and gather straw for themselves. And he says, you don't reduce it, right? Don't reduce it for their idol, right? They're, they're, they're crying out saying, let us go and sacrifice to our God. He's like mocking them. Like they want us to go sacrifice to our God. Uh, uh. Let more work be laid on them. Then he's like, um, thus says Pharaoh, the taskmasters, they go off and they say, okay, I'm not going to give you, go, I'm not going to give you straw. Go get yourselves straw where you can find it. Um, yet none of your work will be reduced, re, be reduced. So we're not going to give you the straw. You still got to make the same amount of bricks. So the people were scattered abroad throughout all the land of Egypt to gather stubble instead of straw. And the taskmasters forced them to hurry, fulfill, saying, fulfill your work, your daily quota, as when there was straw. Um, then the officers of the children of Israel were beaten. So um, they, they got beat and then they were asked, why have you not fulfilled your task? So they're like, <laughs> you asked for a break. You didn't get a break. All you did is you got your straw taken away. You got the same amount of work that needs to be produced. And you just caught a whooping on top of all of that. So the officers of the children of Israel came and they cried to Pharaoh saying, why are you dealing with us like this? Right? Why, why are you doing this? Why are you taking away our straw, asking for the same quota to be met? And then you're kicking our butts. And he says, indeed, uh, he said, there is no straw given to your servants. And then they tell us to make brick. And indeed, your servants are beaten, but the fault is in your own people. It's your guys' fault. You took our straw away. But the Pharaoh said, you are idle. Therefore, you say, let us go and sacrifice to the Lord. Therefore, go now and work for no straw will be given to you. And so then um, they were like, well, why? Why, why, what's going on? And then it said, as they came out from Pharaoh, they met with Moses and Aaron, right? They just, they just got basically put in place. And they're over here saying, let the Lord look at you and judge because you have made us abhorrent in the sight of Pharaoh and in the sight of his servants to put a sword in their hand to kill us. They were upset with Moses and Aaron, right? They were mad. They were like, look, man, we, we, we were slaves. We already had it bad. You tell us to go take a break. And um, now we got it even worse, Right. Shame on you guys for, for, you know, attempting to get us some freedom. Why would you ever ask for a couple of days off? You guys are crazy. You just made it worse for us. Look, a part of, um, a part of serving God there, suffering comes with serving God, right? You, you can't, uh, you can't separate that, right? Jesus suffered. Jesus was perfect. And yet he endured suffering. There is suffering that we must endure as followers of Jesus. The discouraged Hebrews, they almost turned their back on God, right? In this moment, they, they, they almost just were like, let us just get back to being slaves. I, I, I would prefer, you know, being a slave over being free, even with the discomfort, even with the suffering, even with they, they, they embraced their chains. They were embracing the chains and the bondage that they were in because it was, you know, it was what they were used to. It's what they were accustomed to. I wrote this. It says, just because you're, or I, I didn't write, I read this. Just because your circumstances look bleak, don't give up on God. God's plan for you includes remaining faithful through suffering 
and setbacks. This is what I was talking about with the fair weather fans is just because my team's going through a rebuilding stage for the last 40, 50 years doesn't mean that I should turn my back on them. There's going to be setbacks. There's going to be suffering. It's hard to be a Portland Trailblazer fan. There's been lots of ups. There's been lots of downs, but I'm going to be loyal and faithful to my team regardless of their record. At the end of the day, it's the same thing. My hope isn't in this lifetime. My hope is in eternity. Your life might be characterized by suffering, pain, turmoil, tragedy, hard times. But at the end of the day, we hold tight to the truth of the fact that our treasure, our true hope and faith is found. It's put and placed in eternity. It's not here on this earth. And again, I just want to encourage you guys, don't be fair weather Christians. Don't just serve God when things are good and things are looking up. Cling to God through everything, through everything. God is so good. He's so faithful. He's so loving. Mm -hmm. I want to say a prayer. I want to get up out of here, let you guys have a, a great rest of your Monday, your Independence Day. As, as you guys celebrate Independence Day here in the U.S., maybe you're not in the U.S. and you're not celebrating it alongside with us. I want you to celebrate your independence from sin. Somebody asked me this morning, I, I woke up and had a message and it said, uh, what does freedom in Christ mean? He says, it, the Bible talks about being free in Christ, yet I'm still in bondage to certain sins. Does this mean that I have the freedom to sin freely. And I was like, wow, man, the great deceiver, the accuser of the brethren, the way that he would twist and manipulate scripture um, and the sadness that filled my heart speaking to a follower of Jesus who thinks and believes that they're still bound. You guys understand that when Jesus died on the cross, when he was resurrected, the, the bondage the, to sin was broken. You are no longer a slave. You are no longer bound to sin. You are no longer, right? The shackles to sin were broken. We are no longer ruled by temptation. We're no longer bowing to sin. We no longer bow to fear. One of the greatest deceptions that the deceiver has, has you know, the, the wall that he's pulled over your eyes is that you're still bound to your sin or is that you're still ruled by temptation. Understand that you will be tempted but the power that's in us is greater than the power in this world. The same power, the Holy Spirit that dwells within us, has, has, we have the power to overcome temptation. The only thing that you're bowing to is the, is the thing that you are choosing. You're choosing. If you're falling into sin, it's not an accident. It's something that you're choosing. You're no longer bound. You're not bound. The, 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 the captives have been set free. The chains have been broken. You're no longer at the whim of, of every fleshly desire, every thought that pops up into your mind. You don't have to bow to it. You don't have to pursue it. If you're out getting drunk, that's because you want to and you're choosing to. If you're looking at pornography, it's not because you have to. It's because you're choosing to. Right? If you're, if you're out having sex before marriage, it's not because you have to. It's because you're choosing to. If you're living in sin, it's not because you have to or because sin has power over you. It's because you're choosing to live like that. It's your choice. It's your decision, right? That's what the scripture says. The scripture says that you're no longer a slave. The scripture says that if you resist the devil, he must flee. But the resistance that many of us put up is, is futile. The resistance that many of us put up is, is we don't truly resist. And it's not the devil that makes you do it. It's your own fleshly desires. It's your own, it's the, the things that you're doing that you don't want to do. It, 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 you, you do want to do them and you're choosing to do it. Do you understand that? Oh, that's it right there. It's no longer me that lives, but him that lives within me. This is, I'm a vessel for the Holy Spirit. I had to tell my friend, no, you're no longer bound to sin. You, you're no, there, there are no bondages in your life. The only bondages that you have are the bondages that you're allowing. Just like the Israelites, the Hebrews, they ran, they want to run back to their chains. They, they want to stay bound. They want to stay in slavery to sin. They're, they're not walking and experiencing the freedom that Christ has given us. They're not walking in the fullness of who he's called us to be. Do you guys understand that? 
You are free. Not because of anything you've done or not because of anything you deserve, but because of what Jesus did. Because of what Jesus did. Mm, it's so good. What if you don't want to do those things the question was asked? Then don't do them. Then don't do them. There, I mean, I, I don't, I understand that there's levels and um, there, there's maturity. There's maturity. You guys understand that? There, uh, so, so newer Christians, maybe you just got saved. Maybe you're new to the faith. Um, understand this. Or maybe you're old in the faith and you just need a reminder. You have an identity. Who God says that you are. You are a child of God. You are a royal priesthood. You've been chosen and set aside. Um, there's other things that the power in you is greater than the power in this world, meaning that you are a vessel for the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit resides inside of you. God is always with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. There are promises in the Bible and there is a description of who God says that you are, right? Who God says you are is exactly who you are. And, and um, when you start to understand that and know that, right, this great deception, the lie that the enemy has told you, it no longer stands. So the enemy will say that you're weak, that you're powerless, that, um, that you're sinful, that you're still guilty, that you should be living in shame, that you should be filled with regret. He will start to whisper these lies and these little things to you that will make you um, start to question your identity and who you are in him. And um, the, what happens is we start to listen to these lies. We start to believe these things. We don't understand what the word of God says. That's why there is a huge emphasis in this ministry and the ministry that God has given us. He's put in a burden on my heart to say, hey, we need to be reading our Bibles, not just cliche wise, but putting this emphasis that we must be in the word. We must be in the scripture because the scripture is our truth. The scripture is our sword. So when the enemy attacks, we fight off the attacks of the enemy with the scripture. The scripture is what tells us who we are and it tells us the power that we have. It tells us, uh, you know, the, the power that the enemy has, which isn't which isn't power over us. We have to understand who we are. We have to understand understand what Jesus did. We have to understand the power that we have. Amen? So if you're new to the faith, there's this emphasis on the word. There's this emphasis on the truth. What is the opposite of a lie? It's the truth. So if the father of lies, the accuser of the brethren, the great deceiver, if his tactic and his main weapon is a lie... We fight that with the truth, right? We have a lie over here. We have the truth over here. The truth is found in the word. So when these things are being thrown at us, when these things are coming to try to uh, knock us off the path that God has us on or to confuse us, right? Because God's not the author of confusion. He, there is no confusion with God. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So when the enemy's using lies and deception to try to confuse us, we stand on truth. We remind ourselves who we are. It says I'm no longer a slave. It says that Jesus came to set the captives free. It says that we're no longer attached to these yokes of bondage to sin. That those, those things are no longer a part of who we are. Right? So let's just, uh, let's just stay grounded, man. Let's keep our nose in the word. Let's keep our hearts in the word. It talks about writing it on the tablet of your heart. It talks about hanging it around your neck, always bringing it to memory, always bringing it to the forefront of your thought, the forefront of your heart, running to it. The word is a refuge. The word is a solid rock. The word is an anchor. It's all of these images of things that are unshakable. You put an anchor down so that your boat doesn't get taken off by the current. Right, The current of culture, the current of the society that we live in is flowing against the direction of God. And if you're not anchored in the word, you're going to get taken away with the current of the culture. So we use it as this anchor. The scripture is an anchor. It keeps us grounded. It keeps us in place. It's our GPS. It's our true north. We, we, we call it the, the firm foundation. The world and the current of culture is built on the sand that's constantly moved by the storm and moved by the waves and moved by the things things of this world. But when we build our lives on the firm foundation of the word of God, there's no storm. There's no, there's no, there's no rain. There's nothing that can move us. It's this picture of being immovable, like the, like, uh, like a mountain and Christ is our refuge. He's our mountain. He's our foundation. He's our anchor, right? He's our anchor. 
So we're not moved by every tragedy, by every storm, by every issue, by every trial, by everything that, that comes against us. We're not moved and tossed about on the waves like a leaf out on the ocean. We need the word. The word keeps us grounded. We ride it on our heart. We hang it around our neck. We bring it to the forefront of who we are. We're constantly going back to it. We hunger and thirst for the law. We meditate on it. We pray on it. Um, and, and we just keep, we keep, we keep coming back to it. Anyway, let's pray. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you for today. We want to thank you for your truth. We want to thank you for your word. I pray that your word would fall on um, receptive hearts. God, help us not to be fair-weather Christians, not just to put your word, your scripture uh, in our bio description. Help us not just to be Christians when it's convenient. Help us not to just be followers of Jesus when it works out in our favor, when we need a blessing or we're in the middle of chaos, but help us to, to be with you, to cling to you through all times, at all moments. Help us to pray without ceasing. Help us to focus and, and uh, focus our lives on relationship with you, with fellowship with you day in, day out. God, we need you, not just in the, the bad times, but we need you at all times. God, help us to understand. Give us the, the knowledge, the wisdom, the understanding that uh, true relationship starts with you. And from our relationship with you flows the goodness of life. We start to see things different as we see you first. God, help us to look at life through the lens of our Lord and Savior. Help us to start seeing opportunities rather than obstacles. God, help us to start seeing moments to preach the gospel instead of mountains of opposition. God, we, we, God created us a new heart. Change us. Help us to strip away the layers of things that we've made it. It was never supposed to be what we've made it. Help us to strip away those layers. Help us to, to, ref, to just refine us. God, whittle away the rough edges of our character. Help us to be open and honest and transparent, to be more vulnerable, to make it okay to just come out here and say, hey, I'm not okay. God, I need you. I need you in every aspect of my life. I don't have anything figured out. I'm here on this rock and I'm, I'm, I'm lost. God, I surrender and submit everything at the foot of your throne. Everything that I think that it is, everything that I think that I need or I think that I want many times comes from uh, me following what this world deems as success. But true success is found in fellowship and relationship with you. And God, that's what I want more than anything. That's what I want more than anything. God, close doors that have been opened by my flesh. Shut down opportunities and relationships that aren't from you. God, give me the eyes to see that many times when I take the wheel to my life, I'm wrecking it or I'm taking it down a path or in a direction that doesn't line up with your will. God, and that's what we want right here, right now. And that's what we ask for as we leave this place. We pray that your will would be done here on this earth as it is in heaven and in every aspect of our life, because that we understand is true living. That's what we want is your will. And we pray all of this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. Mm -hmm. God is good. And that's what we want is we want his will. Many of us are chasing after things that we think that we want only to find out when we get it. That's not what God had planned for us. That's not a part of it. We get, we, we, we get so consumed with what culture says is, is success, what this world says is what we should be wanting and we pursue those things and when we grasp them when we get them either you're constantly pursuing them or maybe you get a chance you're lucky like me i was lucky enough to get those things at, at a younger age to see that they weren't what they said that they were i went after accolades achievements awards financial success i went after what this world said would make me happy and i was one of the lucky people who was able to achieve those things i got them and when I got them, I'm just like, yes, I've arrived. I've got the things that the world says is going to bring me peace, happiness, fulfillment, and satisfaction. But when I got them, I was like, yo, this don't feel right. 
This doesn't feel good. There is no peace. There is no satisfaction. There is no contentment. This doesn't look or feel like success. Why is it that I got everything that this world told me would bring me peace, yet I have an absence of peace? In fact, I want more of what they said would uh, bring that. And then I would go out and I would get more. And upon receiving it, I'd be like, I'm still empty. I'm worse off than before. Why is that? Why am I so empty? Why am I so numb? Why am I left wanting more? Why is there such a lack when the world tells me that that's exactly what you need? And so it's this perpetual hamster wheel where I'm constantly chasing after what this world is telling me is going to bring me these things. Fame, clout, influence, money, experience, things, all of these things. And I would get them and got them. Relationship, women, drugs, alcohol, all of these things. And, and I say that I was lucky because at a young age, I was able to get them only to see that it meant nothing. So I'm not, I don't have to be in that place. Uh, there, there's no allure of receiving those things because when I get, it's like, ah, none of it, make, it doesn't make sense. I'm not distracted because God allowed me to get those things at an early age. So now I can sit here from a place of experience and say, it's all empty. It's all empty. Don't be blind. Don't make the same mistakes that I did. I spent a good portion of my life chasing after what this world promises will bring you peace, happiness, and contentment. And not one of those things did. See, sin satisfies for the moment. For just a moment. In that, that, that there's like a blink, there's like this moment where he's like, oh, that's it. But immediately after, you're left empty, numb, wanting more, filled with shame, guilt, regret, frustration, discouragement. And then you're just like, oh, okay, so for that moment, it felt good. It must be it. So I just got to go get more of it right? Fill in the blank. That sin could be sex. It could be drugs. It could be alcohol. It could be a relationship. It could be money. It could be success. It could be anything. And so that little, that little glimpse of satisfaction, because sin does have that element of there's a little bit of satisfaction in that little bit of sin for just a moment, but it was never intended to fill that God shaped hole in your heart because it's counterfeit, right? It, it, there, there's an internal need that we have that only God can satisfy. And that sin has just an inkling of satisfaction. And so for just a moment, you think that's it. And you continually chase after it. And I believe that the hole in your heart continues to get bigger. And it's God-shaped. Only God can fill that hole. Mm. God is so good. So good. I love you guys and I honor you. I appreciate every single one of you. We've gotten long-winded. I think I said today was going to be short. It's not, clearly. Hope you guys have an amazing um, rest of your Monday. We'll be back here tomorrow with Revelation chapter 13, Exodus chapter 6. You guys have an amazing day. Be safe out there. Be safe and um, protect yourselves, okay? <laughs> I don't want to come back to people uh, who have blown themselves up playing around with fireworks. So have a great day. See y'all tomorrow.